last time on the podcast. I used to write for stand-up comedians, and I'd watch them on the Tonight Show, and I then I joke I wrote got a huge laugh. Now there's no credit there, you know. Gary Shanley didn't stop and say that joke was from Mark Evanier, you know. There's no credit for that, but it got a huge laugh, and I was proud of that. I had done my job well, and you can take pride in that, even if you're not credited. Uh, even if you didn't think you were paid that well, you sure. can still take proud. Oh, I did that right. So, well, and that's that's what it is. It just isn't enough to just do other people's work. Sure. From Wakefield, it's the Nolan Car Night Show, inviting you to join Nolan and his guest this week, Mark Evanier, to the show. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Nolan. Now, in, in the seventies, you would work for a little known company at the time called Hanna Barbera. And leading the charge with the comic book division, with that, whether you know you thought of it as a grandiose moment or, or not, to be part of that and that be the head of the, that division, what did that mean to you at that point in your career? It was fun. I got to work with new writers. I get first of all, I got to give some new writers their their first job. I got to work with writers and artists, particularly who I'd brought up reading. I loved reading the. Huckleberry Hound comic books drawn by Pete Alvarado when I was nine, ten years old. And now Pete Alvarado is drawing the Huckleberry Hound comic book that I'm writing. Uh, you know, that's that's one of those looking glass moments. Wait a minute, sure. I'm suddenly on the other side of the 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 the, the dividing line. Uh, but the nice part of it was I felt I could do it. Yeah. And I and and you know, at what point Hanna Barbera, for the very first time they ever put any of their cartoons out on home video, this was at Beta. This is before there was VHS. I was hired for very little money, and the money didn't matter, to pick out the cartoons on the first right. release. I did it from memory. Oh, wow. I, I used to sit down and go, Well, what was my favorite Huckleberry Hound cartoon? Oh, I wanted that, that one. And, was, and I'd write them all out, and then they, they would send me, they sent out 60 millimeter prints from a vault back east so I could watch the cartoons and make sure that they were what I wanted and, and I, I was remembering them right. Yeah. So I'm sitting in an editing bay at Hanna Barbera with a flat top thing where you thread the film and you watch it on a little screen projecting the, the image and I'm sitting there watching Hanna Barbera cartoons and I said to myself I want to tell my father I'm getting paid for watching Hanna Barbera cartoons. <laughs> Remember when I sat in front of this TV and and watched these originally? I just made that pay for me. Yeah. And then as I was sitting there, Don Messick poked his head in. You know who Don Messick <laughs> yeah. was? And he heard his voice. He pokes his head in, and going, "What are you watching?" And I said, "I'm watching a Yogi Berra cartoon." You're come on. And he gives it, and oh, we wow. I'm watching the cartoon with Don Messick, and and. Uh, and he he didn't remember it because it was you know one of seventy five million cartoons he did sure. over his lifetime, but uh, I just felt real nice about that. Years later, when they put Top Cat out on uh, home video for the first time, they had no records of who had done the voices on those episodes, and this, particularly the the guest voices who were only in one episode playing guest star roles. Sure. They knew who played the regular characters but they had lost all records and mm -hmm. there were no prints that had the end credits on them at all. There, this, this, it just didn't exist anymore. So my friend Earl Cress and I went and we volunteered to do this. We watched them all and wrote down, okay, this voice is this person, this <laughs> voice is this person. And those full actors got checks or their estates got checks yeah. because we recognized their voices wow. and, and we helped them get, you know, some, some, sag money uh, yeah. payment for residuals and such and i was very proud of that type of thing i did the uh, commentary track a couple years ago for it's the criterion edition of it's a mad 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 world it's myself my friends mike schlesinger and paul scrabo spending three hours discussing this movie and and taking all this stuff we learned about the making of the film and putting it down to help other people of the mo who love the film understand this and explain why this scene was this way or how this yeah. scene was cut or whatever. Um, I love doing it. It's one of the reasons I say yes to podcasts when they ask me, like you ask me, I think, yeah. I think I got all this ridiculous knowledge floating around in my head. And sometimes it's nice to, to share it with people so that it doesn't just die in my brain. 
Well, it's interesting, and and I say this completely honestly. And granted, I grew up in a different era than my parents, who grew up with the Hanna Barbera cartoons of the six fifties, but they're not from the fifties, but sixties and seventies, which was I I think the the best era for cartoons. And later, when I was growing up in the early to mid two thousands, Boomerang would rerun the these cartoons on there, and that was some of my childhood, and I I love that stuff so much. Magilla Gorilla, Great Ape, and I think Quick Draw McGraw, and the wacky races and things of that nature that made it so enjoyable. You mentioned Don Messick, who you would work shortly while later in the 70s on Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. In terms of that, though, because he wasn't, to my knowledge, the original voice of Scrappy-Doo, if I'm not mistaken. No, was that, was, that was Lenny Weinrib. So in that, in that situation, then, you're writing in the terms of how Lenny would speak it. So when Don came in to voice Scrappy, how much did that change your viewpoint in writing that show. Well, I just only wrote on the Lenny episode. Oh, right. I didn't work on the later ones. But here's the thing. One of the things that's fascinating here is that everything in my life intersects, right? Lenny Weinrib was the voice of Scrappy Doo. Lenny Weinrib was also a member of the cast of the first show I wrote for Sid Marty Croft. <laughs> now, Lenny Weinrib was on the Dick Van Dyke show a couple of times. Lenny Weinrib did voiceovers and it's a mad, 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 bad world. Lenny Weinrib was on a lot of the shows I grew up on. He's a lovely man. I got to know him. I he became good friends. Um, and I just loved having Lenny Weinrib in my life. Yeah. I spoke at his funeral. Um, and Lenny was just a, you know, there's an, another example of someone I was very fortunate to get to know and to work with. Lenny was on the Gar. We had him on the Garfield show a couple of uh, times. He was a lovely guy, funny, brilliant in his way. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the case of Scrappy, and oh, here, here's what happened. The first season, Lenny was doing uh, Scrappy Doo's voice. They went through like 11 other people before they picked Lenny. Uh, at one point, Don Messick was going to do Scrappy. At another point, Frank Walker was going to do Scrappy. <laughs> at one point, Boz Butler was going to do Scrappy. They just went through voice after voice after voice. And Lenny was finally the one they went with on the air. When they got to the end of the first season, Lenny was demanding more money to do the second season. He wanted oh. a raise and he didn't know how to work with the voice director at Hanna-Barbera. He didn't, he and, the, he and the voice director weren't getting along, which was probably Lenny's fault. Lenny was having some problems at the time. Uh, so one day I get Bill Hanna asked me to come in and see him. And he says, Mark, will you voice direct the Scooby-Doo show next season? We can't get Lenny to work with the current voice director we have. So, so we asked him who he would work with and he mentioned you. And I said, well, okay, it's it's all right if the current voice director doesn't mind. I want to take his job away from him. He said, no, he'll be happy. <laughs> and I went down to the voice director, a guy who, who's going to direct all the other shows. With them. His name was Gordon Hunt. And I said, they've uh, asked me to take over directing the Scooby-Doo show. He says, please take it off my hands. I can't work with that guy anymore. So for about one day, I was going to voice direct the Scooby-Doo show. And then Lenny wouldn't settle with them on the amount of money for his services. So he was off it and then they didn't need me. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, these things, it's all intersects. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, if I had worked on the episodes with Don Messick, I probably would have had, you know, Lenny's voice in my head and they had, the, well, you know, when on Garfield, the original Garfield show, Lorenzo music was the voice of Garfield. And then on the new Garfield show, Frank Welker was the voice of Garfield because Lorenzo passed away. And it took me a while to stop writing in my head for Lorenzo and to start writing for Frank. And that's why when I was directing the shows, I, I would rewrite the lines in the session. So I hear Frank read a line. I stop, let's change this because yeah. it, it'll fit his voice a little better, which was nice, which is one of the benefits when you voice direct your own work, you can just change it in the recording sure. session. Uh, which is something I couldn't have done on, when I was at Hanna Barbera because I didn't voice direct for Hanna Barbera. Sure. Now, whether it be from 1969 Scooby Doo, Where Are You to HBO Max's recent Velma series, you've been a part of this franchise, for, connected to it for so many years. With the historical and societal impact that it has and the legacy it has, what does it mean to you with all your other work that you were a part of this magnitude that is the Scooby Doo world? Well, I was an infinitesimal part of the world. Okay, never forget that. I mean, I mean, 
I never even saw 95% of all the Scooby-Doo cartoons, let alone had a, had a role in their making. Uh, I was, it, it's a brag, you know? I mean, people introduce me as, you introduce me as, as, as with Scooby-Doo as a credit because people know the name of it. But I didn't have that much to do with the success of the show. I didn't, I, I helped to get renewed one season when we added Scrappy-Doo. Sure. That's about the extent of it. You have to be humble about this stuff and recognize, you know, that you're just, there's a saying a lot of actors have. You get a job. Remember, it didn't have to be you. Sure. Okay. It wasn't predestined that you would get this job. <laughs> yeah. They auditioned 15 people and picked, it happened to pick you. And they may have gone e, me, me, my, me, mo, or the first, their first and second choices may not have been available and you were the third choice. Yeah. <laughs> you have to remember that. So it's, you're you're not you know, destined by God to have any particular job here. You're just the guy who got the, managed to be lucky enough to get the job yeah. who they thought was competent enough. So it doesn't mean a lot to it, it's it's a good brag. Hey yeah, I had a hand in Scooby Doo. But actually, you know, half of a fingernail is more like <laughs> it's it's not even that much. It's 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 not that Scooby Doo does not have all this longevity and success because of me. <laughs> especially compared to someone who's been with it the whole time, like Frank Welker has yeah. or various other writers who wrote long swatches of it. I wrote two or three episodes of the show and a bunch of comic books. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, of course, is something of yours that is celebrating its 35th anniversary, which is Garfield and Friends. And, you know, even though it was also, of course, as a comic in, in newspapers and, and so forth, and I'm sure book versions for, for a good chunk of time, you helped bring it to another level with the television show, which also then became the Garfield show 20 years after that. How did that come into your lap in terms of writing for it and also having a big role with it? Well, there was a period there where I was writing a lot of shows for different, different animation studios for all three networks. At that point, there were three networks, CBS, ABC, and NBC. And I was writing for all of them and jumping back and forth. I wrote a lot of pilots. I wrote quite a few pilots and I had a, there was one year, I think I wrote a pilot for each network and it sold. Uh, and I took my names off some of those shows over the years because I didn't like the way they turned out later. And one, one or two cases, uh, I had a few, huge fights with the people who, <laughs> who owned the show, who were trying to get my name off it because they could put somebody else's name on it, you know. Um, but I had, kind of run out of studios I wanted to work for. Um, so CBS had me writing a pilot for a Michael Jackson cartoon show. Oh, oh boy. Which, you know, this is back when they thought Michael Jackson would be a good influence on kids. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I worked on the show. We developed it. We wrote, I wrote some stuff. I met with Michael a few times. Very unusual, interesting man. Really? <laughs> uh Yeah. <laughs> And finally, I decided the show would not work. Michael had put all these restrictions on what he would do and what he wouldn't do. And I went to CBS. I tell people I moonwalked off the show. <laughs> there you go. I just said, you know, I can't make this work. And they had paid me this money. And I said, I'll give back the money. And the lady at CBS, who was in charge of children's program, he said, well, why don't you keep the money and write another script for us? Can you write a Garfield script for us? And I said, okay, you want me to go meet with Jim Davis and talk to him? Because I know he controlled Garfield very fiercely. He was sure. very protective of the cat. And she said, no, just uh, just go ahead and write a script. <laughs> just write me a script for Garfield, Garfield episode. So I went, okay, I'd never been given that kind of direction yeah. before, okay? So I lived close enough to CBS that I had walked to that meeting. All right. And I took, on the way home from that meeting, I walked past a bookstore and bought all the Garfield paperbacks I didn't already have, which was three or four of them at the time. I think there were like 12 out and I had nine of them. And I came back to this office and I wrote a Garfield script and I turned it in to CBS and the lady there, her name was Judy Price, a wonderful woman who helped me a lot, um, said to me, is this a good script? Are you happy with this script? I said, yeah, I think it's fine. You, you'll read it and try to decide for that. She said, no, I'm just going to send it to Jim Davis. <laughs> if you like it, I'll, I'll, send it, I'll take the chance and just send it to him. So I thought, well, doesn't he know about this? She said, no. They had, they, Jim had written primetime Garfield specials, which they had done like a dozen of them at that point. 
And Jim was resisting doing a Saturday morning show because he didn't have the time to write a Saturday morning show. And he didn't think anybody else could write Garfield to his satisfaction. And Judy had said to him, if we find a writer that you trust can write the show the way you want it, will you let us do the show? And he said, sure, but I don't think you can find someone. Because Garfield at that time was the biggest name character yeah. who wasn't encumbered. You know, at that moment, you know, Warner Brothers has Bugs Bunny yeah. and Disney has, you know, Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse and so on. And Garfield was just Garfield. Yeah. No big corporation at that moment owned it. That has since changed. But at that point, Jim Davis owned the character, and Jim Davis and his syndicate. So she sent the script to Jim. And I thought, oh, he's going to be mad that I think I can write Garfield as well as him or something. Yeah. And two days later, I get a call. Woman says, uh, is this Mark Evan here? I said, yes, it is. She said, please hold for Jim Davis. And Jim comes on the line and says, well, I guess we're going to do a show. <laughs> and the deal was that I had to write them all. Oh, wow. I was not offered the job of story editing the show with other writers. I was offered the job of writing all the episodes. Oh, right. Because Jim did not want anybody else writing them, which made me some enemies because there were other writers in the business who called me up and said, hey, I hear your story in Garfield. When can I pitch some ideas? I said, well, you can't. <laughs> You're asking me for my job. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah. So, um, so I wrote all the episodes for the first season. I wrote all the episodes for the second season. Later on, I had a girlfriend of mine help me with some scripts, but... Um, I, you know, I basically controlled all the scripts and supervised them and ended up voice directing the show. And CBS kept picking it up year after year after year. It was a number one show for a number yeah. of years there. And we had a great time. And we finally reached the point where we had so many episodes, they wanted to put them into syndication. And CBS wanted to not pay so much for them because every year the price of the show went up. Sure. And the producers... You know, I got together and they said, let's stop it now and cash in on the syndication rates. Sure. So we stopped the show. And then a few years later, a new Garfield show came yeah. along with a French company. And I did that. Now, I'm, I'm curious, seeing as, as you just said that Jim Davis had a tight grip on Garfield, and deserves so because that was his you know product. But compared to when, when you're writing and you're writing all these episodes and all these stories for the show, how much of you, and I asked you earlier about Scooby and changing voice actors, but how much of this now, seeing as you had a big input, did you want to continue in the way that maybe Jim was doing it or yours being a little different version of it? Well, Jim was doing, you know, one primetime special a year. I had to write a half hour every week or so. And we also had, they wanted six and a half minute cartoons. Jim was writing half hour stories. And you need to diversify. You can do one story a year with just the cat, the dog, the owner, his girlfriend, you know, I mean, you, you to, to, to do, you know, we did 13 half hours the first year. We did 26 more half hours for the second season because they made it an hour and you need to add more characters. You need to have more situations. You need to take the character to new places he's never been. So what I was trying to do is to keep the character consistent and do with him with him, what Jim would have done if he'd been writing all those scripts, which would be to diversify it a bit and add in new supporting guy characters and add in new villains and add in new situations and find things for the character to do we hadn't done before. If you kept the core character faithful, if you kept the Garfield personality, he could go anywhere. He's still Garfield. So we could put him in outer space or we could put him in the Arctic or we could put him yeah. in... <laughs> In, you know, Abu Dhabi or someplace like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you just sit there. I mean, people try to overanalyze this stuff. It's like, okay, I got to write a Garfield script. What should I have him do? Yeah. Oh, I'll put him here. Yeah. And I, I, I'd have an idea for something. A lot of the stories started with something that was pissing me off. Sure. I was annoyed about something. So I wrote a, <laughs> I used that annoyance to write a story. Yeah. I would, I would, um, I was getting, uh, um, I was sick of salesmen coming to my door all the time and annoying me. So I wrote a story about John Arbuckle. Garfield's are getting real sick of salesmen coming to the store, <laughs> the door, annoying him. It's yeah. like that. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's tough to explain to someone who doesn't know how to do it, how to write a joke. Sure. 
Uh, and it's very difficult to explain to it, even to someone who does know how to do it. Yeah. It's just, you think of an idea, it makes you laugh. It's a joke. Sure. Well, it's it's always curious to see how far you can go creatively without making it so um, far out left where it doesn't seem realistic. For you, the show ends. It's super successful as it deserves should be. Were you interested in keeping it going besides the 20, 20 years later when it came out, or were you ready for that part to end? Well, even when I was doing Garfield, it wasn't the only thing I was doing. Sure. And in fact, we took, we, at one point, we were so far ahead. Uh, we had this deal, the animation studio uh, in Taiwan that animated it. They had a unit dedicated to us. There were the people there who specialized in doing Garfield. And the deal was essentially we have those people as long as we keep a steady flow of work going to them. Sure. And so we kept sending scripts over and, and we weren't writing scripts based on when they needed to air. We were writing them based on when the crew in Taiwan needed work. <laughs> so we kept this continuity of work going uh, there. And at some point we were way ahead. We had, we were writing shows that weren't going to air for two years or we were finished animating shows that weren't going to air for two years. And CBS said, we don't want to pay for more episodes. So for one season, I did an episode, a show called Mother Goose and Grimm using the same unit. We kept, kept the same people. And I did Mother Goose and Grimm for CBS for one season. And that kept the people busy while we used up some of our Garfield backlog. And then we went back to making more Garfields. Yeah. So, but even then, you know, while I was doing that, I was still doing Gru. I was still writing comic books for other companies. I was writing a book called Crossfire for Eclipse. I was writing a book called DNA Agents for Eclipse. I was writing some stuff for DC. I was writing other cartoon shows for other studios. I wrote uh, some specials for Sid and Marty Croft during that period. I wrote, uh, I don't know what else. I was just doing a lot of different stuff. Sure. And so, you know, Garfield was a joy to do. And I loved it. And I would have done it as long as we could. But I never made it my entire life. Sure. It was just my entire life, certain weeks when I had to get a script done. Sure. I'm I'm curious for you. I mean, you, you look and maybe a prime example of this is Indiana Jones. They came out with the recent, the, the fifth and, and final one with Harrison Ford. I saw it recently. I thought it was pretty good. Some others don't like it. And that's their opinion, especially after, though, the C Crystal Skull version, which nobody really liked. It's always a situation, I'm sure, of, you know, do we want to risk making another one after how four one did or vice versa? When it came 20 years later to make the Garfield show, how, now I don't say nervous, but how reserved are you in, in the sense of you create something great previously, could we possibly cre recreate that magic again? Uh, I didn't think about that at all. I just thought, oh, fine, I like Rand Garfield. Let's give this yeah. a try. It's working with some new people, with some new rules. The primary market for the new Garfield show was European. Oh. They had the shows were going to be kind of simultaneously done in both English and French. And then they were translated into another language. And we were reaching a wild world of audience. And, you know, there were some restrictions. I couldn't do shows about baseball, for instance, or yeah. I couldn't do puns. We had to take cut down the word, word jokes because most of the people who watch those shows were watching them in other languages than sure. English. So, and the producers in France had their own ideas, which we, we were able to work together. And they, and they were really wonderful what they did. The, the, we had the a fabulous director named Philippe Vidal who did amazing stuff with everything we threw at him. He was just brilliantly talented. Um, but it was still, you know, I mean, you know, what happens is every show you do is a new set of challenges. Sure. And when I was doing variety shows a lot, every new show was completely different from the one before. And you either take the, you either take the gamble, you can make it work or you don't. And I used to like the challenge of, okay, now how are we going to make this show work? Here's a new guest star. Here's a new celebrity. Here's a new approach. This show, we did short jokes. This one, we want longer sketches. This one, we want, you know, something that, that was going to make this, this star laugh, whatever. Um, it, it's, it's, I, I don't understand, you know, people who sit there all day and make omelets. <laughs> I just, I, I'm not faulting them or not. I just not a job I could do because, you know, yeah. one ham and cheese omelet is a lot like the one before it and a lot like the one after it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and it, and it takes skill to make a good omelet too. Sure. But it's just, 
I, I like the diversity of it. You know, yeah. um, um, someone once told me that Conan O'Brien, you know Conan O'Brien, yeah. um, he had a motto when he was starting out in show business as a writer. And he said, I don't care what happens to me as long as it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And I think that's just something to that. Um, you know, I don't make any claims about all the comic books or shows I've written, but they were all interesting. Sure. From my standpoint, they were all yeah. fun to do. I got anecdotes from about every single thing I've ever done. I've got stories about every single show, every single project. Uh, I met interesting people. I met new relationships. I, I met women. I met got people, comed comedy legends. I met different folks. I wrote songs for a lot of shows. Uh, uh, one I was doing one variety show and we needed some songs written for the show. We had nobody else to do them. So I did them. <laughs> so I wrote the song. I got to write songs and, and that was an interesting challenge. Sure. And sometimes they would just turn to me and say, you know, go meet with one, one day. Producers me, go meet with Hugh Hefner. He's going to get me on the show. So I had to go up to the playboy mansion and meet Hefner and hang around there. What a hardship being at that place. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just, fascinating life sure. all you want to do is have it be interesting yeah. and anybody can do that it's not me sure. it's just you you have to just appreciate the fact that you when you have a challenge you it, it, it's a new it's a new puzzle to solve it's, it's something brand new sure so and and it, it's definitely something that makes life more interesting when you're able to make the pot of everything that you've been a part of much more colorful and different than if you just stuck to one certain thing I want to ask you this and maybe this is too self-indulgent of, of yourself but you know you're still creative you're, you're going to be creative to the to your last breath looking back on what you've achieved and accomplished and what you've written and whatever the case may be what do you want the legacy of Mark um, Evanier to be at the end of the day I don't care <laughs> I just no uh, you know Nolan I I, I understand the question completely yeah. All right, I've had it thrown to me different ways. It doesn't matter. I enjoyed what I was doing, right. and everybody can, you know. And you know, um, I have this theory. Um, somebody once asked me, you know, did you ever ask anyone for their autograph? And I said, yeah, I've asked lots of people for an autograph. And I said, uh, they said who? And I said, well, I got an autograph from the performer, the actor, whose work I think will last the longest. <laughs> of anyone alive centuries from now whatever state humanity is in will still be enjoying this man's work yeah. i believe and they said you know who is this is it you know is it is it tom hanks is it you know spencer tracy no no it's mel blank yeah mel blank's work will probably live on and dawes butler and a few of those other people i i really believe that bugs bunny will outlast every movie star we've ever heard of sure today all right so i don't think about longevity whatever i've done if people watch it fine if not i won't be around to not to notice they're, they've, they've forgotten my work sure. that doesn't matter i really you know you, you got to get the self image out of some of this stuff. Sure. you've got to just say here's what pleases me i did something it worked out okay or it didn't the next thing maybe i'll work out okay sure. you, you can't Get pretentious about this with yourself. You should take yourself too seriously. That's a trap to fall into. And I know people who've done that. And they're so self-obsessed with their place in the industry or who cares about them or how. I know people who go to con conventions and are angry if they don't get asked to sign their autograph a certain number of times. Wow. They actually have like a quota in their head. <laughs> or if they see someone else has a longer line for autographs. <laughs> and I just thought, no, that doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. The first of all, those people are not signing, getting your autograph in most cases because they want to treasure your work and think you're wonderful. Sure. They're getting their autograph because it enhances the retail value, resale value of that comic book. <laughs> yeah. All right. You know, people come up to me and they've offered me money to sign copies of Guru Number One. Those are for resale. Yeah. Those will be on heritage auctions or eBay eventually. Yeah. They're enhancing the value of a piece of property they have, which even if they love it, they're going to leave it to their kids who will sell it because they need the money. Yeah. Fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I just don't care about it. I sure. don't care what, what, what 
um, you know, you know, I understand that somebody as you as an interviewer who's interviewing lots of people with lots of accomplishments. Yeah. You're curious about how they view their accomplishments and their sure. place. Yeah. That's nothing wrong with that. I just don't think about that. It, sure. It's it, it bothers me if I find myself thinking about that. Just do the work. Make be happy with it. Be pleased with it. And then, edit, you know, and somebody out there will love it and someone out there yeah. will use it to wrap a fish with. Um, one what what of the funny things that happens in the comic field, you go to conventions and every so often someone will come up to you and they'll say, oh my God, you're my favorite writer. I love your work. Now you have to not let that impact you so much because 95% of the time they will then say something like, you know, my two favorite writers are you and, and then they will name the guy I think has the least talent in the business. <laughs> And I'll go, oh, great. Yes, sure. Thank you. I'm in the same category as him. I'm so pleased. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, you can't you can't let your life be judged, be affected by the opinions of others because opinions are capricious things. Yeah. It's it's it, I know people who are who they don't win an Emmy and they're crushed. Yeah. They, because somehow the Emmy was going to be the validation of something they were insecure about. Yeah. And then they win the Emmy and they get to deep depression that it doesn't change their lives. Sure. I mean, really, I know people who whose lives were hurt by winning an award because they thought, oh, my God, now people will line up to offer me the best deals in the world, yeah. and they weren't working, and they got bitter about it. Sure. It's like, don't you know I have an Emmy? Well, yeah. it doesn't hurt, but it doesn't help that much. Sure. You know what the Emmys do? They make your parents real proud. Yeah. <laughs> When I first now I was nominated for one, I wanted to win for my father. After my father passed away, I didn't care about it. Yeah. I didn't stop going to the I even stopped going to the ceremonies when I was nominated because it doesn't matter. Sure. You have to be happy with your life. Sure. And that's and if you're happy with your life, nothing else matters. Well, I'm so sure with, with, with I, with I know this is not the answer oh, you were no, no, no. no, thinking, great. There, but but I think it's it's just you know get in touch with your own feelings and and figure out. What matters to you? Sure. If matter, if what matters to you is being famous and being recognized wherever you go, okay, great. I think that's kind of a a dead end sure. ambition. It doesn't, you know, put money in your pocket or make you happier in, on on certain levels, maybe. But if that's if that's what pleases you, fine. Uh, what pleases me is to always be doing something I enjoy doing. I'm I'm doing uh, I'm prepping for Comic Con right now. I've got yeah. my schedule of all the things there i'm doing go. there right here and i'm going to be doing 13 panels five interviews two signings i'm presenting an award i've just got you know lunch meetings and breakfast yeah. meetings and it's and it's going to be just activity sure. solid activity for four or five days and i love that yeah. it doesn't matter you know what happens in any of these things sure. that much i mean I, I i hope people enjoy the panels we're doing I yeah. know they will because I'm going to get some wonderful people on them. And yeah. if you get good people on your panels, a rhesus monkey can have moderated. <laughs> believe me. And frequently has. Well, I'm, I'm sure. And you said, and of course, you know, if, if you find happiness in whatever you're doing, that's number one. And of course, if anybody else after that enjoys it, that's enjoyable to an extent as well. Before we end here today, and again, thank you so much, Mark, for doing this. I want to end on a little segment called the One Word Challenge. She went tell us that this is out there, a few names of people places or things that have some connection to my guest and they have to do their best to say a word or two or sentence that comes to mind when they hear it. So are you ready? Okay, go ahead. Uh, first one, Santa Monica, California. Uh, my birthplace. Uh, Los Angeles. My Where I live since then. <laughs> uh, television writing. Enormous fun. Comic book writing. Enormous fun. Uh, hard work. Um, I don't do hard work. I do <laughs> things I love. Uh, success. Uh, if you're happy that that if you're happy with what you're doing, you're that's a success, and you can pay the rent. Sure, uh, Dan Spiegel, brilliant artist, loved to ever. Uh, Jack Ruby, Jack Ruby, yeah. What do you mean Jack Ruby or Jack Ruby? Uh, no, Joe. No, was it <laughs> Joe was Ruby? It Joe Ruby, yeah, Joe Ruby. <laughs> yes, okay. Jack Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> yes. I, I I don't have any feelings that's about that. him. Joe, uh, Joe Ruby was was a wonderfully lovely man. Who read a cartoon studio? I worked for him a lot. I learned from him. I, I 
was very happy with our association until his business affairs person drove me screaming from the building. And uh, Bill Hanna. Bill Hanna. Uh, I was in awe of Bill Hanna for his legacy. There you go, legacy. Yeah. And all the work he'd done and all the joy he brought to people. And uh, it was tough to work for, but I respected the hell out of him. And last but certainly never least in this cosmic universe, well called Earth that we live in right now, Mark Evanier. Him, uh, you don't want him on your show. He's <laughs> full of full of stupid stories and such, and his name's hard to pronounce. And uh, and he won't. Uh, he just keeps saying stuff about you know you got to be happy in life. You don't want to listen to him. Well, Mark, I want to say sincerely again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me and share your stories. It's always interesting to talk to someone like yourself who's willing to open up and and. Tell about the tales that they've experienced in life. Okay, well, thank you, Nolan. Before I agreed to do this, I watched a couple of your shows. They're very good. And I hope you keep doing them and parlay this into something that you want to do for even a bigger, you, you deserve an even big. I don't know how big your, I have no idea how big your audience is, but it should be bigger. Well, that that, that means a great deal. And I always want to try to try to get to that aspect of, of people appreciating well those out there actually no i'll say this before i end here uh you mentioned comic con is there anything else that you that's that you're working on that's out or that will be coming out soon or that you'll have coming out in the future like comic con uh we're doing another volume with pogo reprints which i love because i think it's the greatest newspaper strip ever and i am proud that i get to present them to put those books together and i was proud my, my late girlfriend carolyn who is walt kelly's daughter uh, I promised her when she was dying that I would make sure the books all came out and they're all going to come out. And I'm proud that I'm going to fulfill that promise to her and to all the Walt Kelly fans, because the man was a genius and his work should be preserved. And there's always a new Gru book coming out. Uh, we've got one that'll be out for San Diego, a new mini series. And I've got a TV show project that's under an NDA. I can't talk about, yeah. but I think it's going to happen and it'll be exciting. And even if it doesn't, I'll do something else I like. Sure. Well, all those out there enjoy this because who the hell went and down the line when Mark gets inducted into a gajillion Hall of Fame, so if he's not already in them, you're going <laughs> to say, say, holy crap, I should just subscribe. So subscribe, comment, share all that fun jazz, follow on Twitter, Nolan Car Knight, and Instagram, the Nolan Car Knight Show, and the words of Johnny Carson, the dean of talk shows, certainly like this one. I bid you all a heartfelt good night.